for the people listening, it might sound a bit extreme saying we're living under financial oppression. Mm -hmm. But I believe the way that we, sort of what you said, the way that we are able to reflect now on those things that happened in Rome in in a few decades or maybe in a, hundred, in a few hundred years, people will look back at today yeah. and they will think the same way about today as we think about Rome. Yes. And if you would go even go a hundred years back, you know, the history a hundred years back, I mean, it was so cruel. Yeah. First World War was just a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today we, we can't imagine something like that to happen. So mm -hmm. I think in a hundred years, we will look back at today and we will reflect on the fiat system and we'll be thinking, okay, you know, what happened there? Yeah, agreed completely. Um, where do you think we are right now, though? Do you think it's going to be like darker before the dawn? Things are going to get worse before they get better? Or how do you, how are you looking at the next few decades? No, I, it's difficult to predict the future, but unfortunately, sure. I think yes. Yeah. I think the way that um, the way that humans work is we have to learn the, the hard way, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also the way that. Uh, people understand Bitcoin is through um, negative experiences with the fiat system. Mm -hmm. Three years ago at the, at the start of COVID, you know, I was so, uh, I felt so, uh, so pressure to tell everybody, you know, about yeah. Bitcoin and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, and then, and everybody was dismissive about Bitcoin and, you know, also the whole narrative of inflation being uh, transitory mm -hmm. and so forth. And now three years later, people understand inflation is not transitory. By def definition, it can't be. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the world's first startup accelerator program focused exclusively on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what is possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to Wolf nyc.com today to apply for the program or learn more again that is wolf nyc.com leon von Koom, welcome to the what is money show thanks for having me it's great to have you here um we just met right here in jackson hole wyoming we're yeah. both here for the bitcoin ski summit we're having a real live fireside chat today beautiful setting <laughs> so for people listening on audio if you hear our fire make a big crackle like that that's what it is um and just by way of quick introduction you run the real estate and bitcoin investment strategies at one west development that's right um can we start with just a little bit of backstory on you um sure. who are you where do you come from how did you get into doing what you do and then we can talk a little bit about bitcoin yeah i'd be happy to <clears throat> so um my name is leon i'm from from germany um I was introduced to, to Bitcoin um, 10 years ago while studying uh, philosophy 
in Bath. Um, I was always drawn towards, uh, I'd say, uh, counterculture mm. in uh, Austrian economics. And uh, when I learned about Bitcoin, I just intuitively liked it. I didn't even really question what it was. Mm. Somebody uh, told me about Bitcoin and I immediately um, felt that um, this was something that had uh, potential um, in solving some of the problems that we have and some of the problems that the fiat system mm -hmm. uh, created. And then in 2013, I remember I was um, back at home in Germany, in Hamburg, visiting my parents. And I was sitting in front of the TV and I saw that Bitcoin spiked to $1,000. Uh, mm. By that time, there was a lot of um, demand, I think, at least that what's what the story was from Chinese uh, investors mm. and people trying to um, yes, uh, bring their money out uh, of China. <clears throat> and that really um, then uh, sparked my interest for Bitcoin because before I didn't see the potential in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I just liked that it was uh, existing outside of the fiat system. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that moment allowed me to understand the full potential of Bitcoin. And then in 2015, I was studying financial economics in uh, Glasgow at the University of Glasgow. And I decided to write my master thesis about Bitcoin and its mm. potential as a monetary alternative. And I focused on um, emerging markets and Bitcoin's potential for emerging markets. And ever since, I've been really going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Bitcoin allowed me to understand myself much better. And I started mm -hmm. questioning a lot of things that I, that I learned. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that happens to most people that, uh, that um, start to engage with Bitcoin. They basically question the norm, the mainstream narrative of not just money, really. It's just it's 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 money. It's it's society. It's politics. It's it's a paradigm mm -hmm. paradigm yeah. shift, you know. And then um, after finishing a uh, university, I started to work in, in real estate. Okay. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the past uh, eight years. And oh, most cool. recently, I've been um, uh, combining both fields. Gotcha. Okay. So you came into Bitcoin pretty early then. Yes. And you got it immediately. I didn't get it. I just intuitively felt it, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Yeah. I didn't understand um, the potential it had, but I intuitively liked it. I didn't right. even question it. I just heard about it. Somebody told me, you know, there's, a, there's an internet currency, a native yeah. currency in the internet yeah. called Bitcoin. I was, I think, 19 at the time, okay. studying philosophy. Yeah. And I just, um, I didn't even question it. I just felt that that's, that's what the internet needs, you know? Yes, yeah, well, yeah, hats off to you for realizing that quickly. Um, it took me a little bit longer, I guess. I was just one of the many that was skeptical at first. Yeah. Um, okay, so when we first met, we, we stepped off the plane here in Jackson Hole for the ski summit. You just returned from doing something really interesting. Um, I, I don't know if you call this cold water training. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit like what you were doing, where you were at, um, and what that was all about. Sure, sure. I have recently um, been to Finland. I went to um, uh, Helsinki and uh, went ice bathing, cold exposure. I was introduced uh, through cold <clears throat> exposure to a very good uh, friend of mine, Moritz Klatten, who is a boxing coach mm -hmm. and who I train with. And he uh, took me to Amsterdam to uh, do a seminar with Wim Hof uh, about two or three years ago that was uh, during COVID. And mm -hmm. um, now in, uh, in Finland, we went uh, ice diving. So basically you, you go with, you have a bathing suit and you, um, you dive under ice. And um, the cold exposure is something that during COVID really helped me to sort of distance myself from the general fear that's been spread, you know, by the media, the government or mm. whatever you want to call it. It's something that's uh, been helping me to, to focus and also diving much deeper into Bitcoin, even though, you know, I got involved with Bitcoin early on and I got it um, from a philosophical perspective. It also took me some time to fully trust uh, in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, by, and by trusting in Bitcoin, I also mean trusting myself. Right. Um, and the code exposure has been really helpful to, to do that. Really? The video that you showed me of you doing this was fascinating because you guys are literally out on a frozen lake, I suppose. Yeah. And it looks like heavy equipment was brought in to carve this giant hole. Yeah. 
and then a diver goes under the water, you follow him in, you're just in like swim trunks exactly, in this yeah. freezing cold water. And then you swim, what, like 10 meters following a rope and the diver underwater to another hole that was cut like 10 meters away to come out. Um, it just seems like absolute craziness. Like what is it that motivates you? What, I guess, how did you phase yourself into cold therapy? I assume that's not the first thing you did. Mm. Were you doing ice baths originally and then you, you phased into this or what was your progression? Exactly, that's how it started. Yeah. I started with ice baths and then this is something that um, that um, um, Moritz Klatten, my friend, who introduced me to, mm -hmm. um, to cold exposure, and I have been uh, thinking about for some while. And um, we have another good friend of us, uh, Daniel, who's also a Wim Hof instructor and who's been um, working with, with Wim, I think, since, I think, 13 years. He was one okay. of the first instructors in Germany. And for the past, past couple of months, we've been uh, discussing the possibility to go a step further. Mm -hmm. Um, to go under the ice and really face our fears because what happens down there, at least that what, what happened to me is that the first two or three seconds, you you panic immediately. Yeah. And then you really have to calm your mind and just accept, you know, that there's something greater than you. That's uh -huh. that's nature. Nature is brutal. And if we learn to, to live with nature um, and sort of overcome our fears, mm -hmm. we, we, are, we, can, we can step into, you know, into a new paradigm shift. And I think that paradigm shift um, is linked to Bitcoin. Yeah. Because if, if you think about the system that we live in right now, it's all about don't take any risk. Mm -hmm. um, don't do anything that you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, be afraid of this, be afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And the code exposure allowed me to, to get rid of my fears and um, also um, become more comfortable in walking the path, you know, that Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, allows us to, to walk. Yeah, I'm reminded of that quote, when you do what you fear, fear disappears. Yeah. And then I like the, the analogy to Bitcoin because there is this aspect of Bitcoin that it's we're working with nature rather than against nature. Like exactly. the fiat paradigm, I mean, it's very obvious, right? From an economic standpoint, you must produce before you consume. Yet the fiat paradigm is the opposite, right? We're trying to incentivize and accelerate consumption to drive yep. growth. And that comes at the cost of savings, investment, production. And so, yeah, it does seem like moving onto a Bitcoin standard is more like according ourselves with nature mm -hmm. rather than trying to fight, you know, the proverbial tide, something like that. Exactly. And just accept, you know, nature's way. We can't change it. I think also right. the whole discussion about ESG, generally speaking, I think it's healthy to use resources more efficiently, mm -hmm. but um, we are not able to change nature's way. Mm -hmm. you know, we are, it's, I think it's arrogant for us humans to think that we can control nature mm -hmm. in any way possible. And we just have to accept the flow of nature and flow with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about real estate. So you, I think you've got some interesting thoughts here on kind of bridging these two worlds of traditional real estate investing and then putting a Bitcoin layer on that strategy. Mm -hmm. um, wh what are you <clears throat> do? Like what types of strategies are you crafting? And then who, who are you targeting with these strategies? Mm -hmm. um, I assume this is traditional real estate investors being introduced to Bitcoin. Um, I'm not sure if there's, if there's another cohort you're, you're approaching. I personally think I'm target targeting everyone. Mm -hmm. Because the way that um, it works right now, real estate is the number one store of value in mm -hmm. the world. There's around 330 trillion um, US dollars of global worth um, invested into real estate. That's around 67% of global wealth. Mm. And real estate is also the number one uh, collateral um, used in the world and accepted by financial banks. But um, I will talk about the Bitcoin strategies in a second. I'll just uh -huh, uh, answer uh -huh. your questions of who I'm targeting because mm. I'm not necessarily targeting wealthy individuals only that own real estate. Mm. I'm targeting everyone because without the ability for individuals to build credit, there's no possibility to run a business mm -hmm. and become um, um, sovereign and um, build wealth. So Bitcoin for me, is digital real estate. Why? Mm. Real estate is not owned by people um, because of its utility. People own real estate to store value. And 
because the fiat system and the inflation in the fiat system has made real estate so expensive, mm -hmm. it is impossible for most people to buy real estate and therefore it's also impossible to build wealth. Um, it's much more accessible though to buy Bitcoin. Everybody can buy Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you can, can buy Bitcoin mm -hmm. for as little as one dollar, right? So the ability to buy Bitcoin, buy property, use that um, to build credit and the ability to build wealth is something that matters to everyone. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. And because and I think that is that is something that uh, that most people are unaware of the possibilities that Bitcoin Bitcoin holds. Um, and then the strategies that I built are indeed targeted at people that own real estate. Mm -hmm. People that own real estate are masters at uh, raising outside <coughs> capital. Mm -hmm. Um, usually what they do, if you own real estate, you use that real estate as collateral to develop new real estate and buy uh, mm -hmm. more, more, more real estate, right? But the problem is real estate over the past 50 years, since the Nixon shock in 1971, mm -hmm. when we went off any type of monetary standard and we've been on a fiat standard, has increased in price so drastically that I believe that in the future um, that won't happen. Mm. So the potential, the upside potential of Bitcoin in the future is much larger. So the business opportunity for a real estate investor to leverage the value of real estate into Bitcoin uh, represents a much better business opportunity than buying more real estate because mm. the upside potential of Bitcoin is much larger. And um, if we, is, you know, real estate is a $330 trillion asset, um, if we assume that Bitcoin captures somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of that value, mm -hmm. that would mean that um, a single coin would be worth anywhere between 1.5 to 2.3 million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a possibility that we can see in the next 10 to uh, 20 years. So um, using uh, Bitcoin in your, uh, in your portfolio mm -hmm. uh, in order to participate in the value increase of Bitcoin represents a better business opportunity than real estate itself. Hmm. And something else um, that uh, I've recently thought about is using, if you own property, you can use the rental income of your property mm -hmm. to stack sets hmm. to, okay. uh, and also to build maintenance reserves for your real estate. Because right. the, way that, the way that real estate works is it's also um, heavy regulated. Mm -hmm. So in the future with the ESG requirements, people will need to modernize their real estate and Bitcoin is perfect money to build maintenance reserves mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's disinflationary, right. meaning it's increasing in purchasing power over time if demand increases yeah. and the demand of Bitcoin will increase because of its superior monetary properties as a store of value. Mm -hmm. If you compare it to real estate, it's uh, it's fixed in supply. Real estate is not fixed in supply. Mm -hmm. You can buy more real estate. Mm -hmm. It's harder to confiscate. Mm -hmm. It's harder to tax. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to liquidate or move in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. And the way that the world moves right now, there are geopolitical headwinds and macroeconomic headwinds. I think it's fair to say that we are possibly moving in a third world war in some way or another, mm -hmm. rather it's in a, on a cyber level or on a physical level. So the ability to have property that you could move easily is very important. Yeah, no, lots of great points there. Um, is this kind of like creating a bridge for traditional real estate investors who you said they have used their property as collateral historically to either acquire more real estate or to build businesses. It's just adapting that strategy, but for a Bitcoinized future, right? Exactly. So you're, you're using the yield on the property or encumbering the property to stack sats basically. Yeah, exactly. um, that seems like kind of a natural segue for, for real estate guys. And they, I've always thought too, that Real estate investors should be naturally predisposed to understanding the value proposition of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? They, what do they always say? Like, buy land, they're not making any more of it, yeah. right? It's the same thing with Bitcoin. It's yeah. like there's only 21 million, so it's somewhat obvious that if you keep pricing it in the thing they're making more of, dollars or fiat currency, that, you know, number go up, as mm -hmm. we say. So how has that been for you? Are you? I imagine there's a lot of educational component to this where you're trying to orange pill real estate investors like are they have they been receptive are they i imagine they're probably more receptive in bull markets than bear markets How, how's that experience mm -hmm. been for you definitely i think they've been very dismissive to be honest with you mm -hmm. um it's difficult for people that 
are used to seeing their net worth in brick and mortar mm -hmm. to understand that digital property is superior to physical property. Sure. But, um, you know, if you look at, at history, um, a car uh, moves faster than a horse. Mm -hmm. um, um, email uh, allows for much quicker uh, change of information than uh, writing a letter. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin as digital property will allow for much faster value creation than, than real estate because mm -hmm. that's a natural, the natural way of, um, of technology. Technology, the, like a new technology usually exposes the uh, weaknesses of an old technology. Mm -hmm. That's something that Seyfedin also talks about when he compares Bitcoin to gold, you know, mm -hmm. Bitcoin um, shows the weaknesses of gold, mm -hmm. portability and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think that because of the bear and bull markets and Bitcoin, that's something that real estate investors are not used to, the volatility. Right. I personally don't believe the volatility is a problem. Volatility is vitality. Sure. Yeah. You know? Okay. That's also, I mean, look at nature. If you look at an athlete, there's athletes that are world champions, yeah. but in between maybe they have an injury, right? Uh -huh. So they go rest. Yeah. And, and markets naturally have a downward pressure right. that central banks through the creation of money and the stimulation of consumption try to prevent. Mm -hmm. But beautifully in Bitcoin, they can't interfere. So I believe that within the next bull market, uh, real estate investors will start to understand the value proposition mm -hmm. of Bitcoin. But I think we need one more uh, cycle yeah. for them to be able to to understand it. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Do you think it's a psychological tipping point, probably price-based? I've long hmm. thought that when you break $100,000 Bitcoin price, the world is going to be shake. It was shaken up a lot at a thousand, shaken up a lot at ten thousand, mm. and for whatever reason, these numbers they're somewhat arbitrary. Obviously, they're orders of magnitude and growth, mm -hmm. but every time you go from you know five figures to six figures to six figures to seven figures, there seems to be this psychological threshold that gets crossed. Do you think that is going to play into the the real estate investor perception of Bitcoin is breaking that price point? Mm, good question. I've, I've thought about it as mm, well. Mm. I think yes and no. I'll tell you what I mean by mm. that. I think once we break 100,000, um, there will be more interest in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but there will be another bear cycle. And I think, I think in that bear cycle, let's, I mean, I don't want to make any price predictions because sure. pr price is secondary, let's, mm. but let's assume that uh, Bitcoin breaks 100,000 and moves to 120, maybe 150K. Mm -hmm. In the next bear market, we move down anywhere between 60 to 80K or so mm -hmm. forth. I think that people become dismissive of Bitcoin again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, for me, I just have a few people that, that I work with um, that I believe to be important for, let's say, my mission. Mm -hmm. The people that, that surround me, the people that I learn with uh, in my company, friends and family. And for them, um, 
it will be the moment where they will understand Bitcoin mm. because I've been telling them for a long period of time um, the, about the potential of Bitcoin. But they, it's like it's too good to be true some, sure. some, somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, but I think the general perception of Bitcoin in the bear market, again, um, will be will be led by people that dismiss Bitcoin because of its volatility. But that's fine mm -hmm. um, because with time, you know, uh, as people get older, uh, the people that, that dismiss Bitcoin and in the real estate sector, a lot of people dismiss Bitcoin sure. like hard. Yeah. I, like I, even sometimes in conversations, yeah. I can I can feel how how angry people get, yeah. you know, when yeah, they yeah. talk about Bitcoin. Yeah, it's something about the I think you hit the nail on the head earlier where the in intangibility of bitcoin is very hard for people to get over gold mm. bugs too right even mm. they're like where is it let me touch it let me feel it but mm. it's um you need non-physical money to perfect the properties of money mm -hmm. which is something i've i've hammered on a lot on this show um and it will take time what's interesting to me though is that the the cycle keeps repeating it's like if it breaks a hundred thousand anyone anyone that's actually paying attention should look at the price history of that asset and say, mm. okay, wow, this is like the fifth cycle that it's done this. Yeah. And at some point you have to capitulate and be like, well, if it just keeps repeating the cycle, then I need to front run what's happening, right? So that it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way. Mm -hmm. But I don't know where that tipping point is. You know, I think it, I think there's some element of the psychological price point, but there's also just the element of people experiencing the pain right that's mm -hmm. happening in fiat world whether mm -hmm. that's increased property taxes or inflation or whatever the situation mm -hmm. is um now when you describe bitcoin as digital real estate is that referring to the land grab that is bitcoin it's like this race to acquire space on the the absolutely scarce mm -hmm. network of 21 million bitcoin is mm -hmm. that what you mean by that or, or what exactly do you mean mm. when you say Bitcoin not, is digital not, real estate? Yeah, not necess uh, necessarily. Maybe that's part of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, because Bitcoin actually is more like land. If mm -hmm. you look at the UTXO structure of, of Bitcoin, the mm -hmm. way that Bitcoin works, the accounting structure, without going into detail, people can look uh, into that themselves. But Bitcoin does resemble land mm -hmm. you know, a little bit. But when I, when I what I mean with the analogy Bitcoin is digital real estate, I mean the following. People do not own real estate because of the utility. Mm -hmm. The utility of Bitcoin, uh, the, sorry, the utility of real estate is rental income right. and it's a means of production. They own real estate because it's a store of value right. and it's a collateral, pristine mm -hmm. co collateral for mm -hmm. lending. But both of these uh, functions, store of value and collateral are two functions that Bitcoin fulfills um, better. Mm. Store of value, it's very obvious. I mean, Bitcoin is the best store of value that, that has existed so mm -hmm, far and mm -hmm. um, the collateral is something i do believe that bitcoin is pristine collateral for lending but i have my issues with lending as, against bitcoin if you need to if you can't self-custody right. the the multi the multi-sig model is something that allows you to to share custody of bitcoin in order to use it as collateral mm -hmm. But there are some issues with that or that we need to sort of find out mm -hmm. and a third third thing that uh, made me think about the analogy is that with with bitcoin you can take a stake in the internet of value mm, if okay. you if you own bitcoin you basically participate in all the value creation that's happening on top of it mm -hmm. which is um layer two the lightning network mm -hmm. and then it's the layer three application um all the applications that are built on bitcoin with the internet inf information let's say that we used until today mm -hmm. you can't do that there's no, no, it's not possible to own part of the TCIP protocol, right? right? right. Um, you can't participate in the value creation pre-Bitcoin in the internet. Mm -hmm. Google, you can buy stocks, of course, of individual companies. Mm -hmm. But with Bitcoin, if you own Bitcoin, you participate in all the value creation that's happening on right. top of it. So it's similar with real estate. If you own real estate in a particular city, let's say, for example, in... Uh, Manhattan, mm -hmm. you participate in the value creation of the city of Manhattan, the, in, in, in the NASDAQ, you know, right. in, uh, in the fashion industry, anything that happens right. in, in, in New York will cause your real estate to go up in price because there's increased demand. Yes. Um, and it's the same with Bitcoin. If you own Bitcoin, you participate in the value creation that's happening on, on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's actually, 
it's quite uh, it's quite logical that you don't need any any other asset. You know, you just need to own Bitcoin, and by doing so, you participate in the value creation that's happening on top of it. Yeah, that's a great way to look at the the analogy of Manhattan, right? Because you've got a small space; it's not really mm-hmm. growing. It obviously grows up in mm-hmm. terms of increasing square footage of real estate and high rises and whatnot. But the more economic success stories or successful economic ventures there are occurring in Manhattan, some of that value accretes to demand for the, the underlying, literally in this case, the land, right? Yeah. Um, and you could analogize that to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's kind of the bedrock of Manhattan and then everything is getting, getting built on top of it, increases demand for block space, which is Bitcoin. There's another aspect to that analogy too, though, is that if Bitcoin is this globally dominant hard money that we mm-hmm. think it's becoming, that not only do you get value capture from all the protocol, higher order protocol development, but it you also get purchasing power accretion from every successful business in the world, right? Yeah, As right. human productivity increases, mm-hmm. the purchasing power of hard money goes up. Mm-hmm. And if if Bitcoin does, you know, succeed in its monetization and becomes kind of this perfect hard money, that's for the rest of time, mm-hmm. right? So like to hold mm-hmm. any share, any fraction of this 21 million, like you have a, you participate in all the economic development that will ever occur across the world for the rest of time, the uh, accretion of purchasing power to your money. Like it's truly mind blowing. That is mind blowing. So <laughs> we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves here though. So what, that all assumes Bitcoin is money and will become dominant money in the future, which obviously a lot of us uh, have very deep conviction on. Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess a logical question to try and pick that apart is the namesake of the show, which is what is money? Mm-hmm. So Leon, I would love to throw that over to you and just ask you your opinion on what is money. Mm-hmm. I think for me, money is, it's a language. It's, it's a language of value. Mm-hmm. It's the way that we value, value things. We value the outside world. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, for example, talk about like value for value, you know, the value for value model in Bitcoin. If I consume content that I, uh, that I enjoy, I, um, I show my appreciation by sending you some sets via the Lightning Network or sending you some Bitcoin, for mm-hmm. example. And um, because our monetary system is broken, nothing has value. You, know? you can see it in countries that go through hyperinflation. Um, uh, historical example is the Weimar Republic mm. in the 1920s. From 1918 to uh, 1923, Germany experienced um, a horrible time of hyperinflation. And then uh, shortly after, the Nazis you know, came, into, came into power. Mm-hmm. Because when money loses value, everything else loses value. Right. And people become pessimistic about the future. So, so money is a language with which we can um, communicate amongst each other and with which, you, with which we can value, value each other. Mm. So it's really, you know, whether you like money or not, it's really the base of human civilization. Mm. I would even go as far as saying that before Bitcoin, we were living... In, in you know under financial oppression in the, mm. in the dark ages mm-hmm. um if we look back at for example rome right now we think you know it's unbelievable that they had slaves mm-hmm. but back then nobody questions that people had slaves right and if you look you know at, at today nobody really questions that there's a system that steals your your time because right. what, what money also is, it's, it's a battery for the time that you have on this earth mm-hmm. because money is something that received by working. Yeah. But if money loses value and I spend my time working, I waste time. Sure. And time next to Bitcoin is the only limited resource, real limited resource mm-hmm. here on earth. I mean, even most precious metals are not uh, fixed in supply. There's, there's, right. there's, you can find gold in space. You, there's constantly new discoveries of gold. Yeah. So the only thing that's really fixed in supply next to Bitcoin is time. Yeah. And a monetary system that steals our time, it's, it's evil. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed it is. Um, and it, yeah, I think uh, reading books on ancient Rome, I think their population, I might be off on these numbers, but I want to say the population was like maybe 80,000 at one point, but they had 220,000 slaves, mm. all right, to support the 80,000. But it was not, 
there was no taboo about it. It was just the way things were back then. And the, I think the connection between slavery and fiat currency is not, it's, it may sound like a leap, but Mm -hmm. when you understand the definition of a slave, like someone that is under a 100% effective tax rate, right? They don't keep any of the fruits of their labor. So Mm -hmm. all of, all of the fruits of their efforts day to day go to a taxing authority or a slave master, whatever you want to call that. If you understand that, and then you could just say, well, okay, what is, where do you fall, right? Mm. What is your effective tax rate? Mm. Um, if it's 33%, then you're spending the first four months out of every year to pay the government before you receive any compensation at all. Yeah, um, That's not a civilized structure, right? Like, not to say that it hasn't, it's better than what it was. It's better than slavery in ancient Rome, let's say, but it's not as good as it can be, right? It, there, there's a, there's a, there's more of an ideal of human freedom and flourishing, I think, that Bitcoin can take us closer to. Um, but you do have to swallow these bitter pills that we're not peak civilization and everything's great, which is becoming increasingly evident uh, yeah. as of recent. So, um, if I may add, add, add something, please. yeah, exactly. I mean, for the people listening, it might sound a bit extreme saying we're living under financial oppression, mm-hmm. but I believe the way that we, sort of what you said, the way that we are able to reflect now on those things that happened in Rome in in a few decades or maybe in a hundred in a few hundred years people will look back at today yeah. and they will think the same way about today as we think about Rome yes. and if you would go even go a hundred years back you know the history a hundred years back I mean it was so cruel yeah. first world war was just a hundred years ago mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and today we we can't imagine something like that to happen so mm-hmm. I think in a hundred years we will look back at today and we will reflect on the fiat system and we'll be thinking okay you know what happened there yeah agreed completely um where do you think we are right now though do you think it's going to be like darker before the dawn things are going to get worse before they get better or how do you how are you looking at the next few decades no i difficult to predict the future but unfortunately i think yes yeah i think the way that um the way that humans work is we have to learn the the hard way Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. also the way that uh, people understand Bitcoin is through um, negative experiences with the fiat system. Mm-hmm. Three years ago at the, at the start of COVID, you know, I was so, uh, I felt so, uh, so pressure to tell everybody, you know, about yeah. Bitcoin and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, and then, and everybody was dismissive about Bitcoin and, you know, also the whole narrative of inflation being uh, transitory mm-hmm. and so forth. And now three years later, people understand inflation is not transitory. By def- definition, it can't be. If, 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 why would anyone lower prices? You know, right. deflation can happen through a limited money that increases mm-hmm. in purchasing power. Mm-hmm. But by definition, um, the inflation can't be transitory because no uh, rational uh, market participant would lower market prices if they um, their inputs are going up. If the inputs are going yeah, up, why would right. they do that? You know, yeah. they would lose. And the profit of an entrepreneur is the difference between the expenses and the profit. Mm. And if the expenses are going up, why mm. would they lower their profits? That's yeah. just illogical. Yeah. And so I think that the way that the world moves right now, unfortunately. Um, we are probably will experience more turbulence, financial turbulence, and yeah. geopolitical, geopolitical turbulences as well. And these are, I assume, you attribute a lot of this to the consequences of bad money in the world. Yeah, um, I do. What What is it in your study of history? Like, what happens to society when bad money takes hold? To go to let's let's put this to an extreme level. If money loses value, everything loses value, including human lives. Mm, you can mm-hmm. see it for. I mean, Germany is a, is a great example of of how you know the how hyperinflation and the uh, the loss of value in money um, caused uh, the loss of um, of human life. You know, mm-hmm. it was also Lebanon right now when people are in. Uh, despair when people are fearful of the future mm-hmm. and and money loses value they uh, they they have a high time preference right yes. and um and usually war breaks out mm. and it looks like this is something that we are experiencing right now as well yeah yeah jeff booth was on this show a long time ago and he had a great quote someone had shared with him which was currency wars lead to trade wars lead to real wars mm. basically and um, it it does seem like we're going through that right now, right? Mm-hmm. We've got obviously 
every centrally banked economy in the world is debasing that has culminated in trade wars over the past few years especially between like us and china is a big obvious one and now most recently we've seen this these frictions sort of heat up into kinetic warfare mm -hmm. uh in the in the russia ukraine conflict now i'd like to tell you about our sponsor crowd health crowd health is a bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance now let's face it legacy health insurance is an absolute scam nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian chris rock insurance you got to have some insurance you got to there's an insurance they shouldn't even call it insurance they should just call it in case shit and i give a company some money in case shit happens now if shit don't happen shouldn't i get my money back <laughs> So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is gonna be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day, days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove so man what you mentioned fear right the, the, there's this psychological implication of bad money that mm -hmm. i guess if you have good money you're able to reduce your fear because you can have savings right you can have some uh insurance policy if you will against the uncertainty of the world but if you don't have recourse to good savings then you're left with nothing but high time preference, fearful behavior. Mm. I often think about that a lot. How, how deep is the connection between human psychology and the integrity of money? Uh, very deep. <laughs> I think I think money is the base of human interaction. Mm. And um, I can see it. I can see it with myself. I can see it with my friends who are into Bitcoin. Um, since I've got into Bitcoin and serious, I've been serious about Bitcoin. I've been. I spent much less money. Mm -hmm. um I, I stopped drinking i put all that money into bitcoin mm -hmm. um i become i became more optimistic about the future um also i have to say that the bear markets they taught me a lot because mm -hmm. in the bear markets 
I had to build character, basically. Mm. I had to build character. I had to, I had to stick with Bitcoin against all odds. You know, the people around me they were telling me, oh, Leon, we told you, mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is a scam. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's, um, it was a bubble and so forth. But I stayed consistent, and that allowed me to build more self confidence. I became more self confident mm -hmm. with Bitcoin. Uh, I became more optimistic about the future because I know the fruits of my labor. Um, are increasing or uh, be, be becoming more mm -hmm. valuable with time. Um, so Bitcoin is, is is optimism for me. That's what it represents for mm. me. Bitcoin represents an optimistic future and the ability to store part of your wealth in Bitcoin um, also allows you to sort of distance yourself from all the troubles in the world, yeah. whether they be macro, macro or geopol uh, geopolitical. Um, and let's if we go back to real estate, mm -hmm. um, real estate creates local dependency, mm -hmm. you know, especially um, let's look at um, examples of uh, what, what about Jews in Germany that were wealthy real estate developers? Mm -hmm. What happened when, when they had to flee the country? They couldn't take their wealth with them, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it's, in, in German, uh, real estate means immobilien, which literally mm. means to be immobile, oh, okay. if yeah. you translate it. Yeah. And um, the ability to have part of your net worth um, and be able to move with it, um, mm -hmm. not being dependent on uh, any physical space, mm -hmm. also um, creates a, list, a bit less depend on, dependence on um, uh, hierarchical uh, structures like right, right, right. the government, for example. No, that's an excellent point. You, you, we've gained a lot of advantages of non-locality under the internet paradigm but we've lacked the ability to move capital in that kind of non-local way. But Bitcoin is, and that's why they call it, right? The internet of money or the internet of value. Um, interesting too, you shared how you've changed as a result. I've had similar transformations in my life. Yeah, I have stopped drinking, um, become much more long-term oriented, I guess, mm -hmm. both looking forward into the future, but also looking back into history to try to understand the future. Um, it's also, yeah, I hadn't really thought about this before, but definitely has encouraged me to drop self-consciousness, um, which is an element of fear, right? This thing that, you know, before you start a new venture or take a new risk, you, you might have that uh, negative self-talk or criticism like, oh, this is going to be too hard or complicated, whatever. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin, something about, and maybe it's come through the vindication of being bullish on Bitcoin. Like yeah. I got this tattoo on my arm yeah. when Bitcoin was in the November 2018 bear market. You know, it was trading at like three thousand, four thousand dollars. Yeah, and people thought I was crazy, right? Like, yeah. all right, man, you, you need to seek counseling or whatever. But I was like, no, I'm pretty sure this asset's like a really big deal. Mm -hmm. And you know, sure enough, in the bull markets, people like reach out to you. The same people oh, that yeah. said you were crazy now they want to talk to you. It's it's very cyclical, but um something about going through that process of being vindicated in your convictions mm. um, helps you become more courageous, I yeah. guess. And and I've had this experience of, of, instead of looking at history as a spectator, you start to look at it as a like a live event that mm. you're participating in. Mm. And um, I don't know, yeah, it, I don't know to what extent Bitcoin has done all mm. that versus just growing up and having kids, et cetera, but mm. it's definitely felt like an acceleration of maturity and responsibility and all of these other things that we associate with, with, um, growing up, I guess. So, um, you mentioned you, so we're talking about real estate again and we mentioned that bad money makes real estate overvalued. Mm -hmm. What is it about that, that it's, that's inhibiting the creation of wealth for people. Like you, mm -hmm. I guess, so people typically have real estate using it as collateral to then build businesses or whatever. Mm -hmm. What's broken in that system that Bitcoin actually fixes for people? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's actually most, most real estate developers, you know, they get also angry when I tell them this and I tell them, it's, it's not that the value of your real estate has necessarily gone up. Mm -hmm. It's basically that a denominator fiat money has gone down. That's right. it's, it's been debased, it's been yeah. collapsing, and real estate has served as a, as a hedge against inflation. Um, you know, that's basically the, the cantilone effect. Mm 
it's the problem is that the money that gets into the economy or even though the Keynesians they would argue you know the money gets distributed into the hands of the consumer they consume and that leads to you know to productive to growth and so mm -hmm. forth but that's like that's actually not the case because the money gets into the system to the people that are closest to the money creation mm -hmm. and often those are banks mm -hmm. and the banks they don't they give out loans right? what mm -hmm. they do with the money I mean mm -hmm. you know, they don't give it to the consumer to spend it they give it out in loans mm -hmm. and those loans usually are taken on by real estate investors mm -hmm. and they put that money into real estate so then um, real estate is it's a utility asset because it's a place where people live mm -hmm. and it's um, and it becomes unaffordable mm -hmm. and that problematic for two reasons people have high costs for standard of living mm -hmm. on a monthly basis if they rent they have high costs and um, which means they have more fear mm -hmm. because you're fearful you not be able to pay your rent sure. you know the next month yeah. again it, it creates fear and then um, second of all it's 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 unaccessible mm. um, if i for example in germany let's say i put a hundred thousand euro to the side um, in the 90s that would have allowed me to take out maybe um, for loans mm. of um, with uh, putting in $25,000 each myself I get another $75,000 by the bank I buy four apartments mm -hmm. I do that you know over a couple of years and I can build like a nice little real estate portfolio for myself mm. provide for myself for the future maybe give out give it as an inheritance to my kids mm -hmm. now if I have a hundred thousand euro I will not be able to buy an apartment mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and and the inability to buy an uh, to buy an apartment um locks me out of the ability to create wealth and bitcoin is much more accessible mm -hmm. and let's it's also for the uh, developing world let's imagine that the ability to build a credit line of a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin it might even just be ten dollars worth of credit can really make a difference with to an entrepreneur let's say in sub-sahara africa mm -hmm. for example um it's not just the developing world that benefits from this i think it's the it's the um sorry it's not just the the Western industrial world that benefits from it, it's the developing world that benefits from it greatly. Mm -hmm. um, when I was writing my, my master thesis about Bitcoin, this was one of the topics that I focused on, the um, possibilities that Bitcoin brings for the developing world. And I think that people like uh, Jack Dorsey mm -hmm. and, and other entrepreneurs that made it in the, let's say, traditional fiat world, they mm -hmm. see those, that potential now mm -hmm. and they build out infrastructure and financial products that allow value creation to happen from the bottom. And if it happens from the bottom, because what happens right now, it's, it only happens at the top, you know, mm -hmm. but it doesn't trickle down. So it needs to happen at the bottom for so people can really raise their standard of living. Mm -hmm. And with Bitcoin, everybody wins. Or ha at least everybody has the chance to win yeah. if they put in the work. You right, know? right. Yeah, no, well said. It, proof of work, right, throughout. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah the, that's an interesting, interesting thing, too. I've had conversations with a lot of people that have gotten into Bitcoin. They say, what is, it's so interesting that everyone wins, to your point. Mm -hmm. The only losers in all of this are, like, shareholders of central banks, mm -hmm. basically, right? The people that are, those that are parasitizing on the wealth of others lose mm -hmm. because Bitcoin's hard to, difficult to parasite wealth mm -hmm. away. So, um, I think, by the way, sorry to, to interrupt, no, but please. I do believe that these people should not get Bitcoin. Because, yeah, you know right. what I mean? But they're, yeah. not, they're not worthy of the power that Bitcoin gives. Yeah. So in that par paradigm shift that, that, that people brings, it's also a shift in consciousness. Yeah. And the way that these people think, you know, it's it's good if they don't get Bitcoin because yeah. they, they then like sort of like the power that they have sort of fades out as Bitcoin grows. Yes. Because Bitcoin is a new system. You can't fix a broken system. You need to create a new system. That's right. And people that believe that the old system that is somewhat evil, like mm -hmm, like we talked mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if these people are aware of it or not, but the consequences of their actions are horrible yes. for the, for most people. Yes. So whether they are conscious about it or not, they um, they should be sort of um, not disincent disincentivized, but they should not have the ability and the power that, that Bitcoin brings. Yeah, that's, it reminds me of that quote that uh, a man has a very difficult time understanding a thing when his paycheck depends on him not understanding the thing. Yeah. So, uh, which is maybe another way of saying everyone gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve, yeah. which is commonly thrown around. 
But yeah, I, I think it is, it's a good thing, right? It's, it's a good thing that those that are being disrupted by Bitcoin are least likely to understand it because they are financially rewarded under the existing paradigm. So mm -hmm. therefore they're, they're very likely to be late adopters, Yeah, which is good, right? Yeah. You want, you're, you're transferring wealth from non-productive political actors to productive entrepreneurial actors. Mm -hmm. And that's a net benefit for everyone exactly. everywhere forever. So that's a, a great point. Um, okay. We've talked about the fiat paradigm, the malevolence that's somewhat inherent to it. What is the relationship then? It kind of almost like begs the question, the relationship between Bitcoin, ethics, spirituality. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to talk about your own personal religious viewpoints as yeah, well sure. and, and how Bitcoin is has influenced uh, mm -hmm. or is related to those, whether or not yeah. it's influenced them. I'm still trying to figure this out, so but, I, but, we, but I'm happy to discuss, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, Bitcoin is inherently ethical mm -hmm. because everybody has the ability to win. Mm -hmm. That makes Bitcoin ethical money. And there are some things that are, you know, natural laws. You, you know not to kill someone. You know not to steal from someone. Mm -hmm. that, but the fiat system steals from everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So it's inherently unethical by definition. The mm -hmm. fiat system is unethical by, by definition. And uh, personally, something I've been thinking about is uh, the relationship of Bitcoin and, and Judaism. Mm. And um, in Judaism, like in Christianity and in Islam, it's not allowed to take interest um, from another Jew if you if you give mm -hmm. them money. The usury, right? That's what it's called. Um, maybe. Okay. Yeah, it could be. Could okay. Be. And something that uh, Judaism does, Judaism adapts usually to to modern culture, mm. and they build a sly roundabout. I want to call it. It's mm. called hita iska in Hebrew. And what what happens is that instead of giving somebody a loan, you become a business partner, mm. and that structure is called the picadon. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that you want to build a business and you need money. I don't give you a loan. I give you money, and we become business partners, and you share parts of the profits with me. Mm. So that's like a sly roundabout to paying interest rates because the way that money works today over time money loses value mm. and you need to uh, offset the inflation by receiving interest rate and and judaism i think has find or has found you know an interesting roundabout to doing that but it's missing the point because the ethical question is not solved mm. it's still kind of unethical still because you are receiving money from someone mm -hmm. whereas Judaism believes that giving money to someone is actually charity. So mm. you not expect anything in return because wow. you're helping them to, to build like their business. Not even the principal then? No. Oh, okay. And like th that would be ideal. Yeah. And Bitcoin allows that. Bitcoin allows that, for example, assuming that you would build a business and I would give you money in Bitcoin. Let's say I say, I want the same amount of Bitcoin back in five years. That amount of Bitcoin will have increased in purchasing power and I don't need to ask you for interest rate to offset for inflation. Right. And this is, some, I'm, I'm currently writing an article about this because I have to understand a little bit more how to structure a loan according to um, mm. Jewish customs right. that is kosher, so to say. Yeah, yeah. But Bitcoin is um, the baseline for allowing a monetary system that's ethical and that also works in line with um, with Judaism and also with, with biblical um, um, with biblical code, with biblical yes. law, which is a natural law. Right, you know? right, right. Because, uh, like I said before, we know some things are so, uh, some things are bad. Mm -hmm. And then I really has to a ask myself how people that have power in the fiat system, mm -hmm. they th often, let's say, Christine Lagarde of the European Central mm -hmm. Bank, for example. Mm -hmm. I've been watching her interviews lately and I can see that she has an attitude that she has some sort of some ethical, you know, there's an there's sort of an agenda behind her that she's doing something good for like by mm -hmm. for example forcing inflation down. She's causing a depression mm -hmm. by um, suddenly raising interest rate after having such a low interest rate and causing uh, causing inflation and she believes that's ethical mm -hmm. because inflation is unethical, which is true, but sh they cause the inflation. Right, 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 right. Yeah. This is the arsonist fighting the fire that they started. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. I, and so it's not just, I thought it was just you can't charge interest on loans, but it sounds like you're saying that lending in general does not fit into the, yeah. uh, the framework of Judaism. Yeah. It's, and that's the same in Islam, I think, too, or at least the, the interest part. I yeah, talked to is, an individual yeah. once. They said you can't charge interest mm, according yeah, it's, to it's, Islamic it's not, law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then if you, you're entering the business, you're putting money up, you're creating some productive business on that, and then you're getting your money back, 
as long as it's hard money, the interest rate's kind of built into it because the purchasing power increases over time. Exactly. So it's the sly roundabout way. Yeah. It's, but it's an ethical sly roundabout yes. way. And the core of the question of not taking interest, it's an ethical question. So if we want to solve that question, I think we have to do it in an ethical way, so to say. Sure, sure. Interesting. Okay. And there's, there's another, an, an, another, another thought. There's another concept in Judaism is um, the concept of uh, staka, of, of giving charity. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews, for example, give 10% uh, of their income to charitable causes. Okay, yeah. And um, I believe um, this is something that Pierre Rochard, I think, has also talked about. By holding Bitcoin, I'm doing something charitable because I'm decreasing the supply. And that means that everybody else that holds Bitcoin has an increased purchasing power. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin in itself is a charitable system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. You're increasing by buying and holding Bitcoin, you're increasing the purchasing power of other holders. You're also diminishing the purchasing power in the fiat system, yeah, which is true. obviously being used to wage war and oppress and all these malevolent things we've mm. talked about. So yeah, that's interesting. It's mm. charitable in a twofold way. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Leon, man, I know you got to get out of here and mm. go speak at the event. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you doing it. Thanks for having me. Where can people find you on the internet? Um, I even though I've been involved for Bitcoin for a long time, I was never publicly, uh, you know, talking about it. But uh, last year, uh, Amanda also encouraged me uh, to to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you ch search my name, uh, Leon Vancom on Bitcoin Magazine, you can find some articles that I wrote. You can find me on Twitter at Leon Amschel, and I set up a website, a system of rules dot com, okay. where I link to some of my work. Wonderful. We'll put all that in the show notes. Thanks again, man. Thank you.